constellation of risks that faced my predecessors have fallen by the wayside, and they've been replaced by technology-driven risks that are emerging at the speed of life. Banks are foregoing billions in revenues by not lending to the segment. Why? The talent pipeline requires constant development to ensure that our successors will be even smarter and greater in number than we. The reality is that the Asian story is alive and well. The core competency is to create a platform for collaboration. I think more closer to home and more medium term Internet of Things for the banking industry is about connecting better with our customers. And the people tend to exaggerate China's economic problems. True, we are facing a lot of challenges, but I believe the Chinese are able to handle these problems. So I believe that we have unconscious biases that actually may drive all of our behaviors. It's not just a gender issue. And there are um, opportunities to actually um, change that. I love how Cyboss actually chooses different markets uh, to place the conference in. You know, the buzz flavor this year seems to be a lot around blockchain and DLT. Uh, that's clearly one, and digital would be the other. Physically being here, just being able to meet with so many people in one area, so many different banks from all over the world, it's very convenient. The ability to interact face-to-face, -to, -face to be able to ask questions, in my opinion, is what truly brings value to this kind of a forum. Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Good afternoon. And I think the video that we've just seen certainly demonstrates what a fantastic week we've had here at Cybus 2015 in Singapore with the opportunity to connect, debate, and collaborate. And we've connected, haven't we, through networking sessions and events right across the week, both during the daytime and also the evening. We've certainly debated through conference sessions and workshops, including the big issue debates and the plenaries. And we've also collaborated on regional and global challenges, issues and opportunities that affect all of us. And I've had the great pleasure and privilege of co-presenting Cybos TV, which has actually been broadcasting right across the week at various times throughout the day. And I've had the pleasure to work with Stephen Shear, who I know is very well known in this part of the world. He's an absolute delight to work with. But we've had an opportunity to interview numerous guests and delegates along those key themes, such as disruptive technologies, critical market infrastructure, and of course, the importance of ASEAN. And if you haven't had a chance to watch any of our TV programs, then you won't be disappointed because you'll be able to do so through the conference app. They live on forever. Now, Cybus has once again explored the global banking environment and discussed key issues which I think are likely to dominate the financial services agenda over the next few years. And what a time we've had in Singapore, which coincided with Singapore's 50th Jubilee anniversary. So, after 11 conference tracks, 200 exhibitors, and with around 400 speakers taking part in all the conference sessions, it's now time for the closing keynote session. 
And I'd like to invite two fine gentlemen to join me on stage to discuss the events from the last four days. So I know you're going to give them a hugely warm welcome. So please welcome onto the stage Alain Rass, SWIFT's chief exec of APAC and EMEA, and of course, the deputy chairman of the SWIFT board, Stefan Zimmermann. <laughs> Gentlemen, lovely to see you. Adeline. Welcome to you. Welcome to you. Adi. Gentlemen, lovely to have you here, and it's been an absolutely Press. fantastic week, so thank you very much for joining me on stage. Let's first of all reflect on this year's Cybos. And Alan, this has been the biggest Cybos ever in Asia Pacific, and now the second largest Cybos globally. When I interviewed Sven, who's yeah. obviously head of Cybos earlier, the figure he gave me was over 8,000 delegates. It was 8,219. And we've had a hugely successful yeah. ASEAN day today. So what does this tell us about the evolution of Cybos and about SWIFT in Asia? Well, evolution of Cybos, um, it's my 23rd, 24th Cybos. I've been there for a long time. A veteran. And, <laughs> a veteran, yes, certainly. And um, I've seen actually this event growing years after years. I think my first one is Berlin, it was Berlin, where we something like 2,000 people altogether. Now we're getting to the 8,000. Um, it's completely crazy. I have to say it on a personal note. Uh, at the beginning of this year, with my teams in Asia, we had said, well, let's have a dream, like Piyush said in, in Singapore, and one day in the, in the planner, let's have a dream about having more than 8,000 people. And here we are in Singapore with more, more than 8,000 people, which is truly really great. So I think overall, that's another, another sign that you know, there's a shift between uh, west to east that is clearly happening. I think also this is the, the mix between the location. Clearly, Singapore is highly attractive. Asia is highly attractive, ASEAN as well. But also the content of the conference. I think we've managed this time to, you know, to land up excellent speakers. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the program was literally amazing. I mean, the content about technology, all of that together is clearly something that has managed to attract uh, many people. I think also that you know, the, the fact that Asia is booming, is really attracting a lot of, inv of investment, the uh, banks wants to be here, is also I mean, uh, and the reason of, of this. As far as we're concerned, clearly at SWIFT, I mean, we expect to uh, think, I think there is, there's a time before this cyber, and it will be a time after this cyber, and we clearly expect to have a huge visibility after this and being able to, to using this to benefit of, of the industry. And Stefan, this has been a hugely dynamic week, an action-packed four days, but how would you personally characterise it? I, I seem to say the same thing every year. It's been a great week and, and so on. But I think this time, if I would have to characterise, you can tell that this type of a surrounding inspires the uh, participants here. It is a dazzling city and it's also perfectly well organised here. But I think characteristically within our exhibition hall and within the conference center, you can tell that people are more positive, that there is more business to be done. There are very exciting technologies out there. Nobody knows exactly where they are going to, so you have to interact to find out. And thirdly, it's always a great opportunity to figure out what other people do in order to have all the explanations for your own proceedings. And one of the guests we had on Cybus TV talked about Cybus exceeding the expectations, which I think is a great tribute to what you've done. Thanks. So, Alan, what do you yeah. think are the biggest themes this year? Well, I think we, it has changed a lot, right? I remember the last two or three years, it was a bit of doom and gloom. Uh, a lot of talk about compliance, regulations, and I, and I know these are topics that are highly important for the industry, making the market safer, uh, making the industry safer, basically making the world safer as well. At the same time, I have to recognize a bit of you know, boring stuff. And here we are here in, um, in, in, in Singapore, it's been a lot about technology, it's a lot about shift west to east, it's a lot about enthusiasm around, about, uh, around China, what's going on there, the R&B, internationalization, the challenge it's posed, but also the opportunities that the, it offers to the, the, the rest, of, rest of the world. So technology is clearly a highlight of the week, and perhaps we'll come back to that later in, the, in, this, in these talks. Um, also, real-time payments, market infrastructures are evolving very fast, and there's innovation happening in this part of the world. So clearly, we will be looking at that. I mentioned China. Uh, there are also many other uh, parts of this, of this, um, 
of this region, like ASEAN, has been a highlight of, of the week as well, I think. So, so many themes, hasn't there? And so much discussion, yeah. loads of debates. And Stefan, um, one of the biggest themes really has been blockchain. Every session, I think probably someone mentioned it in some shape or form. And, and that took over the SWIFT stand during the opening session for Inner Tribe, which again was hugely popular. I think it was standing room only there. And one thing I noticed, the CIO from UBS, Oliver Bussman, spoke at the session about how UBS is focused on assessing the most viable user cases to technology. And there's a quote he said, which I'd like to share with you. And he said that innovation needs to be part of an organizational's DNA, not confined to an innovation team. So did you get an idea from discussions at Cybus about the industry in terms of responding to both the challenges and the opportunities that the likes of blockchain actually represent? Yes, I did. And uh, probably I should be starting that this was one of our opening big issues we had on Cybos. And I think in retrospect, we should have chosen a different room to host them all because <laughs> it was pretty crowded down there. Pretty, yeah. Blockchain technology, and I don't know how it is for you, but I received many explanations what that all is. And I think this session has most certainly helped to cut a little bit through the myth of what blockchain technology is all about. And I think many of us know this is a technology that offers tremendous opportunities in terms of effectiveness, speed, and so on. Nobody knows exactly where this is going to. But I think people embrace it. And I think what we also see that obviously more and more things from outside our very own financial industry are influencing our behavior, the behavior of our clients. And I've seen many people now partnering up, trying to find out what are the firms I need to team up with and to embrace and figure out how best we apply that. So my personal opinion is, of course, we will see more of that technology being applied. And yes, we will see more partnerships. And I think InnoTribe was really successful, wasn't it? I, yes, clearly. But if I may add something that, uh, on, on what uh, Stefan wa was saying. Yeah, clearly. I mean, uh, the technology is there, it's evolving. It's still, I think, in the very early stage of, of its development. Uh, I think also for cyber, there was a time before this one and nobody was talking about that and now everybody is talking about it. Uh, the last two days of cyber have met with a lot of clients and now everybody has blockchain in, on his mouth, right? Uh, on, uh, but at the same time, I sort of feel also that there is a little bit of over-excitement. Uh, so like uh, nobody really understands, sees opportunities, wants to change everything. Uh, also realize that, well, I mean, it will actually bear a lot of investment. So I think it will go, clearly, we need to build upon that, but I'm just a bit worried about the overexcitement that it creates. But if you think about it, Alan, SWIFT itself disrupted the world of manual processing mm -hmm. at its inception. Do you think SWIFT is now well positioned for this latest disruptive change? I know you've just mentioned there that calm down the excitement. <laughs> well, I mean, we, we know more or less what it is, right? I mean, I'm sure that we still have to discover many facets uh, of, uh, of these new technologies. Actually, in all labs, uh, you know, at Swift, in, in La Hulbe, in Belgium, and other places, we're testing this. Actually, we, we, we define ways in which we can integrate it to see whether actually it can work with the product and service we have, how we can build upon that, that new te technology. What we do realize also somewhere is that uh, it can be actually very much complementary to you know, the DNA of Swift. It requires also a community. I mean, the fact that uh, Piyush this uh, Monday afternoon was also saying that the power of network is really essential, right? And we do have that network. So clearly, the values we have around uh, standardization, security, uh, the fact that we have the network, the fact that we have, we have a platform, a community that, that talks together and all that can be complementary to this, right? So, and uh, yeah, we need to see exactly how it will be complementary to what we've done so far and how we can build and leverage what we have today in order to be better in the future. And while I've got you here, let's now look at the impact of digital. And the big issue debate on the Internet of Things was certainly looking at the practical impact on the digital world. So what areas of the industry that people here represent is ripe for the use of digital? Well, when, when you... When you listen through the week, it looks like it's applicable everywhere, <laughs> clearly. 
So, but uh, what I see, well, clearly when it comes to trade finance, uh, it's clearly an area where I see huge opportunities. I think the industry has evolved a really lot to make trade finance, the, the, the trade supply chains, and the, the, the financial chain much more efficient, but still actually a huge room for, for development and improvement. And clearly that technology theoretically actually could be applicable to that as well. In the securities industry, same thing. I mean, uh, there again, I, I met with chiefs of CSDs and they say, wow, that is actually, can completely change the business model and the technology that we've been developing and maturing for many years. Uh, other people told me that in the funds industry, same thing. So it looks like it, it is very much applicable to, to everything. At the same time, you know, uh, devil sits in the details and uh, we need to really define it all together what will be the, the best applications and how we can use all the, you know, the, the values of this community and what we've done for 25 years to make this stronger for us. And before I go back to Stefan, just very quick point. Um, I can see its application for retail banking, but how about wholesale? I mean... Uh, oh, you want to answer that, Stefan. Go on. <laughs> go so, so, sorry. <laughs> but I just wanted to add that what you also see is people have become more realistic, even though there's a lot of excitement and new technologies are very interesting and you'd like to discover what's the opportunity. But I've heard many, many very practical questions to economics, how much can you scale that, who is it partnering with. So I think despite the excitement, there was a lot of business sense probably also given by the pressure we all face in that industry, lower margins, higher cost pressures, and so on. Sorry. Oh, yeah, yeah. You said it all. <laughs> you said it all. Yeah, absolutely. Well, let's stay with Stefan then. And I'd like to move on to consumer expectations as being what I see a key driver for change. So, Stefan, I sense there's a real momentum here. It's like a bottom-up approach that consumer is truly king, which sounds a little bit of a cliche. But before, you know, banks have been pretty much developing products that were really there for profit, the bottom line, and not putting the consumers central to everything that should be done towards them. So I get a sense now that banks are beginning to develop products where the consumer is central. Do you see it that way? Absolutely. I think what we, what we see these days is that people, particularly in that digital world, we all get influenced by different sources. Yes. So I think what we learned is that we also have to go outside our, let's say, uh, industry and see what others are doing. Of course, there's a move to uh, digital, as we said, but there's a move to mobile. There's a move to services which are with you all the time on your, on your iPad, on your iPhone, you name it. So I think we will see that more and more of the, these ideas come from different industry, gaming and retail, consumer type of business. So I think this is a clear trend. And Alan, one of the other key themes has been, of course, the role of China. So that's been another key theme of the conference mm. and its place within Asia. And there's been a lot of talk, hasn't there, about China slowing down, mm. particularly over the last few months, on the commodities and global trade. How do you see China at the moment? What's the impression that you're getting? Well, certainly from, from this week, I do retain one image. Although slowing down, the Chinese economy is adding another Germany every four years. Wow. Right. And that's meant to be the powerhouse. Exactly. Yeah. When you look at what is Germany when it comes to Europe, you say, wow. Yeah. Uh, no, the, the, the reality really, I'm, I'm going to China every month, literally, and, and you see this, this, country, this country really developing uh, fast and putting really everything that it needs to over time even accelerate faster, right? You see that there is clearly a shift from a, a manufacturing economy, based economy to becoming a consumer economy. Uh, they're building also all the infrastructures that are needed to make this possible when it comes to the, the financial systems and the financial industry. The fact that they design also all the processes that will be needed to ultimately reaching the internationalization of the NMBs is actually represent enormous potential for the rest of the industry as well. So, this industry is, is evolving very fast. You see also enormous, enormous innovation. Uh, um, you know, some people tell me sometimes that China is not really innovative. Wow, when you see what is happening out there, you say, wow, they're really innovative. Uh, things like Alipay, Alibaba, you see how they have actually made the model of, of, of eBay, eBay and PayPal 
but a lot better actually for the for the for the for the citizen is literally amazing. So great stuff that's happening there. We for Swift we see this as a, a huge potential. It plays really again to our, our DNA, the, the model we have, economies of scales. This presents a huge potential for the industry, and uh, again, you know, more volumes, prices going down for everybody, and that is what we're trying to do there as well. And Stefan, the big issue debate earlier on, I know many people were there from the audience that we've got here, and we saw the discussion around the rise of the RMB. Frame it in the context of the renminbi being a real, I think, game changer is what we heard. So what's your take on the, uh, on the rise of the RMB, and what does the SWIFT's RMB tracker tell us about its growth? I think it's uh, the, the, uh, the, what we see is the consequence of uh, trade reality. And trade reality is there's a lot going on with China. And uh, our tracker showed that in the meantime, the renminbi has become the fourth largest currency in terms of the payment volumes. And in terms of uh, trade, it has even uh, singled out now the US dollar, has a lot to do with how this business is conducted, but it shows quite clearly how that uh, growth. So I think the, we will see more of that convertibility approaching, and I think, as we know, the Chinese, they have a very long plan, and even though we urge them to accelerate that, I think we will see a step-by-step -step approach towards free convertibility. It may take a couple of months to go. Yeah. That, that, that is what we heard this morning. We had a session about RMB this morning, a big uh, issue debate. And clearly many gentlemen on the, on, on the stage and, and you could sense clearly that in one side you have the, Western, the rest of the world that is trying to urging and pushing China you know, to go faster, uh, to uh, you know, capital, capital markets accounts, all of that. From the gentleman from China, Bank of China, clearly they, he, read, he said several times, banging on the table, saying, you'll follow our pace and we'll decide exactly when is, got, is that going to happen. So I think it's uh, very clear that uh, they want to go their way. Now, another big theme was market infrastructures, and we enjoyed a very engaging market infrastructure forum. Again, on Cybers TV, we interviewed people mm. about this. And the region has seen a lot of progress. This is a question for you, Alan, mm -hmm. in terms of linkages between market infrastructures. So what further developments do you think we're going to see in the next 12 to 18 months? Well, th there was another buzzword at Cybers this time is, is real time. Everybody wants to move real time now. And it's clear that you have a certain number, especially in the, in the payment segment, uh, you have a certain number of, of initiatives going on. Uh, here in Singapore, for instance, uh, th this industry has moved to a real time payment system uh, a year ago. Actually, personally, I'm, I'm living here, I'm using it. And let me tell you, it works. Even more fascinating, before I was making payments and it was taking three days and I was paying. Now it takes me. One, one second, and I don't pay anymore. So that poses also another problem, which is what is the business rationale, the business model that will be supporting this moving forward. But nevertheless, it's clear that everybody wants to have it. I mean, everybody is playing with his GSM, is buying with his GSM, and, uh, and want to have the same thing when it comes to the same interactions and uh, real-time real activity from, uh, from the payments industry. So it's going to happen. Other initiatives are ongoing now that we are supporting in Australia. Uh, over the last two or three weeks, uh, there hasn't been a single week without another announcement out of Europe looking for initiatives as well. I think it's going to move, but uh, again, I mean, we, you know, we need to define the right pace. We need to make sure that all these, these initiatives are coherent, that they play for also for the industry, and that the business model moving forward is, is really real. And very quickly, I know you've got a big chunk of the world under your remit, so APAC uh -huh. and EMEA. Do the changes and developments in market infrastructures in APAC reflect a similar evolutionary path as in mm, other regions? Yeah. yeah, clearly. I mean, you see, you see happening here what has happened in Europe, for instance, over the last, the last five, so five to ten years, right? In, in Europe, you had the, the Lisbon Treaty that, that set basically the baseline to have, uh, to, to have all sort of infrastructures, roads, trains, but also financial infrastructures to be ready supporting the industry. This is happening here as well. The, the only advice I would have or caution I would have is that 
I'm looking for more collaborations here in this part of the world. I look, I'm looking for more harmonization. The industry has to do that. And I see that as it has been difficult in Europe, it is difficult in Asia as well. Okay, now in a tribe, we've got to talk about that. And there's been lots of talk of innovation, hasn't there, Stefan, at Cybos, and plenty of excitement around the inner tribe stand. What do you think is the role of the inner tribe startup challenge in the SWIFT community? It's, it's an amazing concept, isn't it? It, it is, and you, you, as, as we said before, you know, many, many people were very interested to see what's going on there. Let me, let me pick one aspect of it. As we all know, a lot of the influence we see in the future and already how we translate it in the digital world today is coming from outside, let's say, the, uh, the traditional financial industry. So we have... Uh, this, uh, this startup uh, award yeah. where we invite new and uh, fresh entrepreneurs to present their ideas and also give them the opportunity to speak to the potential investors. Well, it was very, very exciting, wasn't it? Because we had Dan O'Prey on the programme this morning. Um, I don't know if you got any sleep that last night. He's from Hyperledger. He was the winner of, winner of the Startup Challenge this year. Right. He was a happy man. It wasn't only about the financial right. incentive, right. but the mentoring programme is brilliant. Absolutely. We have more than 300 uh, firms applying for that. And we started off in, uh, in our uh, African regional conference. Yeah. And two of these African teams made it to the finals here. So... Very diverse, very interesting, uh, and very exciting ideas. Right, very quickly, compliance and risk. I know we could spend all day on this one as well, but Stefan, we've had a very successful compliance forum also in Singapore. Do you think any of the sessions that we've seen has given an idea of how the concept of compliance is evolving? Because it's quite a dull subject, isn't it? <laughs> Not, not really, no. No, <laughs> <laughs> no I, I, I think all, all, in, all in all, uh, we had uh, these sessions, the way they, uh, they go, but I think the diversity also in the, ta in the, in the subject and everything we picked up was well beyond what we had uh, before. And Alan, how are risk frameworks evolving? I love compliance, really, by the way. Well, I mean, <laughs> it evolves, clearly. I mean, uh, I think that the world, so at the same time, is evolving, you know, is becoming more risky somewhere. Clearly, the, the, when it comes to an industry, many actions are being taken to mitigating this as much as possible, to controlling. But nevertheless, I mean, for instance, the more you're going to have new technologies, yeah. eventually the more risk you will have embedded into that as well. So I think we need to be cautious there as well, making sure that we understand this very well, we apprehend this very well, and hopefully we bring the right actions, making sure that once technology is evolving, actually we do that the right way. Now, gentlemen, our time is nearly up, but I'm going to mention the word diversity for you, okay? So stay seated. Now, we've got a good stat coming up, okay? More than 8,000 delegates, but this is where we've got to hit you hard now. 25% female participants only, and only 17% female speakers. I mean, clearly there's some way before we've actually reached parity. So how are we going to address this gender balance? Yes. What we, to what we said before in compliance, we don't want to have only diversity in compliance yes. where we see a lot of depths and breadths uh, spreading. <laughs> but this, this aside, no, here is, uh, I think the diversity is improving and the awareness is improving too, but we need to keep on pushing that and we need to have it on the agenda. And here is also my plea to all of you. You have to help us in the communities in terms of delegation awareness so that the representation we all see here at SWIFT improves in terms of diversity, not only gender diversity, but in general. Well, it covers all sorts of things, doesn't it? Whether it's conscious, unconscious bias, gender and ethnicity, diversity yes. is very wide ranging. But I suppose in many ways, you know, what's good for the, the bottom line is also good for society. And in the end, you need to be as diverse as the communities that you serve. So it makes good sense, doesn't it? Absolutely. But I'd like to add, I don't know exactly, you know, the statistics behind this, yeah. but, but sometimes I have the impression when I'm traveling in Asia that the, the situation is a bit different. I think perhaps a bit better than what I've, I'm seeing in Europe. I don't know for why, what are the reasons, but in some countries where you wouldn't expect it, actually you have, you know, many, many more, you know, female senior directors, executives being present, board members, and it's, it's pretty interesting. Now, finally, 
This has been the biggest ever Asian Cybos, the second biggest Cybos ever. So I think that's a pretty hard act to follow. So what do you think we can expect from Cybos 2016 in Geneva, Stefan? Thank you for the question, Nadine. Yeah. Course, <laughs> as a Swiss representative, I'm yes. particularly proud to talk about Geneva. So first of all, we welcome you all and in Geneva. But we heard from many of the delegates here that they want to come to Geneva. So I'm expecting the biggest ever European conference, of course. And secondly, I should also say we had a delegation led by the government of Geneva coming to Singapore to see how exciting a, a, a uh, venue this is and the high standards we are all expecting. So I'm sure they will do their utmost to welcome us all and accommodate us in Geneva. And you're going to be our personal tour guide because you know it so well. Yeah, I yeah, will yeah. be available to anybody who has special interests. OK, fantastic. Well, in a moment, I'm going to pass the baton over to Stefan to introduce the closing keynote speaker. In the meantime, ladies and gentlemen, please show your appreciation for Alan and Stefan. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. That's brilliant. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much. Um, so let me say first of all thank you to Nadine for I think just a great TV, Cybos TV we had during this week and of course our not only very capable and competent but also enthusiastic leader of our Asian region here, thanks very much for making that such a great Cybos and helping us to also convey these messages. Now, yes, I think we've lost it. It is now my privilege to introduce uh, Mr. Ravi Menon. He is the director, the managing director of uh, MAS in Singapore. MAS is the Monetary Authority of Singapore. A rare combination, it's not only the central bank, it's also the integrating regulatory authority. So a very important man to us in this industry. Mr. Menon, he held several important uh, tasks in the Singapore administration before, amongst others. He was the permanent secretary of the Ministry of Trade and Industry before. And now he holds very, very senior positions in the international financial community. I think to be mentioned, the steering committee he is on of the Financial Stability Board, you know, the authority that has a lot about the influence of what regulation is all about these days. On a personal level, he ha holds a master of Harvard University in uh, public administration. So. I'm very happy to have him here. Do I see him already? There he is. Please, Ravi, come on stage. Thank you very much Thank for you taking very much. time. Please. Thank you. Mr. Yawar Shah, Chairman Swift, Mr. Gottfried Lee Brandt, CEO of Swift, Alan, Stefan, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. It's, it's a delight to be here at the conclusion of what I hear has been an immensely successful conference. I'd like to thank Swift for the opportunity to speak to you. It's, um, in my job, it's always more uplifting to uh, talk about technology rather than monetary policy or the global economy. There's a revolution in communications. What had God wrought? Read the first telegraphic message sent by Samuel Morse on 24th May, 1844. The telegraph marked a revolution in communications at the time. Transatlantic telegraph cables cut communications between America and Europe 
from about 10 days, which is the time it took for steel sh steamships to sail across the Atlantic, to a matter of minutes. In fact, the mid-19th century leaps in transp transport and communications technologies ushered in the first phase of economic and financial globalization. Groundbreaking as the telegraph was, a text message that takes a few minutes to arrive will be considered glacial by today's standards. It will certainly not be able to support the frenetic pace of communications in the global financial system. Thankfully, we have SWIFT. Last year, there were 5.6 billion messages carried globally on SWIFT's network. Close to half of those messages related to international payments, which lies at the heart of global banking. Technology has transformed cross-border finance. It is the conviction of the Monetary Authority of Singapore, the MAS, that innovation and technology will be critical to the future growth and success of Singapore's financial sector. I'm reminded of a PowerPoint slide that I saw while I was in Silicon Valley earlier this year, proclaiming rather immodestly that, and I quote, the geeks shall inherit the earth, unquote. Probably an exaggeration, but we get the message. And earlier this year, MAS shared its vision of a smart financial center, a financial center where innovation is pervasive and the technology is applied widely. It is about pursuing innovation and technology to increase efficiency, to manage risks better, to create new opportunities, and to improve people's lives. At MAS, we are walking the talk. We formed a new FinTech and Innovation Group, or FTIG, within the MAS. And FTIG's mission is to formulate policies and strategies to create a conducive ec ecosystem for innovation while fostering safety and security. MAS has committed 225 million Singapore dollars over the next five years under the financial sector technology and innovation scheme. We've been working closely with the industry as well as reaching out to the broader fintech community. We've been talking to startups, software providers, and experts and practitioners in various fields of financial technology, including data analytics, cybersecurity, blockchains, and digital payments. We've learned much from these interactions. And the response from the industry has been encouraging. Insurers such as Aon and MetLife, as well as banks such as Citibank, Credit Suisse, DBS, HSBC, and UBS have already set up innovation laboratories in Singapore. Aviva has announced plans for a digital garage and AXA for a data innovation lab here. And MAS is working with several other banks and insurers on their plans to establish and expand their analytics and innovation teams in Singapore. At the heart of a smart financial center must be a progressive information technology architecture. Two key characteristics of such an architecture are common standards and two, seamless data sharing. Let me begin with common standards. They are key to making systems interoperable and harnessing fully the benefits of new payments technologies. Lack of standardization leads to fragmentation, inefficiency, and inconvenience. Take, for example, electronic funds transfer. Without a common standard, an application written to effect funds transfers from one group of financial services providers may need to be rewritten to work with another group of financial service providers that operate on different interface standards. Common standards allow systems and applications to operate efficiently and seamlessly when different financial service providers and operators and solution providers come together. The EMV chip is one of the most impactful examples of a common standard. 
it is all the more impressive as it was an industry initiative without any government involvement. NFC, or Near Field Communications, represents the next big thing in common standards. It is enabling contactless payments on mobile devices like smartphones. Yet another good example of a common standard is ISO 20022. This is the international standard for electronic data exchange among financial institutions. Its growing adoption has helped to make payments platforms interoperable and to reduce inefficiency. A successful example of ISO 20022 adoption in Singapore is what we call fast and secure transfers, FAST, F-A-S-T. This is a secure electronic funds transfer service that is available 24-7. We started with 14 participating banks in March 2014. We now have 19 on board. Fast usage has been rising steadily, clocking 18 million transactions since its launch. Fast offers several advantages for bank customers in Singapore. You can pay someone almost instantaneously from your computer or mobile device at any time of the day. You can receive confirmation of payment within seconds. If you're a company, whether big or small, near instant payment and confirmation round the clock makes a huge difference if you rely on cash flow to pay suppliers frequently. With the whole transaction going electronic, you can look forward to more efficient reconciliation of your payments with your financial accounts. In short, FAST is almost as convenient as cash, yet potentially safer and cheaper. While the take-up of FAST has been encouraging for person-to-person -person payments, it has some ways to go for merchant payments. On the payee side, a barrier to adoption by merchants is the challenge of integrating electronic payments with the existing workflow of confirming and reconciling receipts of payment, which is currently done at the cash register. Two of our banks have come up with solutions for this. Standard Chartered Bank has had some success with helping food courts, fast food joints, convenience stores, and taxi companies accept electronic payments by Dash, which is their solution. DBS Bank has just announced a new product called Fast Track, which lets you order and pay for coffee before you even arrive at the counter. It is good that there is a proliferation of such innovative e-wallets, payment apps, and mobile payment solutions in Singapore. But just as man is not an island, neither should payment solutions be limited to themselves. For widespread take-up and usage of any digital payment solution, interoperability is critical. And this is where FAST comes in. With the common standard provided by FAST, banks can more readily collaborate on innovative payments products that are interoperable without having to worry about incompatibility. On the payer side, a barrier to adopting digital payments is the hassle involved in onboarding payees. People should be able to pay each other electronically as simply as writing a check or handing over some cash. It should not matter which bank that I bank with, nor should a payee be identifiable only by his bank account number. Few of us can readily recall our own bank account numbers, let alone be familiar with those of our friends and family and those whom we want to make payments to. I'm pleased to note that the participating banks are studying a mobile addressing system for FAST. This means that you'll be able to make payments through FAST as long as you know the payee's mobile number. May I suggest to the industry to go one step further and explore an all-in-one addressing system. This means being able to pay someone through FAST using also the payee's email address, social network account, or other proxies. Let me move on from card issuance to card acceptance. In Singapore's retail payment scene, multiple points of sale or POS terminals at the payment counters are a common sight. They are a source of clutter and inconvenience. Our vision is a unified POS, a single terminal 
preferably mobile, that can read all kinds of cards. This will allow merchants to enhance efficiency by simplifying front to back process integration and enhance the shopping or dining experience of customers. A unified pause requires merchant acquirer systems to be able to communicate with one another. This interoperability can be achieved through standardization. The technology exists, but it requires some effort and some cost. I'm pleased that the Association of Banks in Singapore has formed a working group to look into standardizing the POS applications to operate efficiently and seamlessly. I commend them for their resolve to address a long-standing bane in our retail payment scene. What have we learned from these experiences with common standards? The technology behind common standards is not all that complicated and is becoming less of an impediment to systems integration. What is more important for operators, subscribers, and consumers to recognize, is to recognize the larger collective benefits from investing in an infrastructure for interoperability and to work out a framework to ensure its commercial viability for all participants. The second key characteristic of a progressive information technology architecture that I mentioned is seamless data sharing. By some estimates, the universe of digital information is growing at about 60% each year. It'll grow even faster as embedded sensors become more common. How to make sense of all this data? We must get the basics right in data management. First, quality data. Data must be rich in quality, free from error, and commonly understood. Second, aggregated data. To extract maximum value, data must be efficiently aggregated. The value of each data point increases as it is connected to other data points. Third, intelligible data. Data must be formatted so that it is machine readable as well as machine usable. For example, it's much easier for a system to process data provided in simple text formats such as CSV files rather than a PDF report. Greater availability and deeper analysis of data helps us to understand the world around us with a clarity and depth that was not possible before. In particular, mashing together diverse data sets offers the possibility of new types of insights. New software algorithms crunch the enlarged big data sets to make more reliable predictions on repayment, for instance, and hence improve the performance of loan portfolios. For example, a lender to small businesses requires access to the company's credit and company's bank and credit card accounts to constantly monitor the company's cash flow and hence ability to repay the loan. Despite the greater availability of data and the possibilities for harnessing this data that's being opened up by technology, financial institutions continue to face challenges on the data front. More data means more cost. While technology has significantly reduced the unit costs of data gathering, it has ironically also raised the potential total cost of data by opening more possibilities for data mining and analysis. One way to improve access to data without raising costs significantly would be for the industry to pool relevant data together. The benefits of aggregating data across the industry can be seen from our experience with the Credit Bureau, which has allowed banks to make better credit underwriting decisions. However, concerns over confidentiality and market sensitivity have held back data sharing among financial institutions and restricted public access to data. One effective way to achieve seamless data sharing is through the publication of open application programming interfaces, or APIs, by financial institutions for data submission. In essence, an API documents how a system operates, what inputs it will accept, and what outputs the system will provide. APIs allow different systems to interact with one another without the need for human intervention. In effect, APIs allow users 
to seamlessly merge multiple data sets from different sources into a single rich data set. Using APIs, systems can be linked to create a system of systems where the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. Smartphones are a good example. Every notification you receive from Twitter or Facebook comes through an API and is displayed on your screen by another API. Financial institutions are already making use of APIs to enhance efficiency in transactions. Again, SWIFT is a good example. Previously, international fund transfers were a manual process. Banks sent telex messages to each other to debit funds from one account and credit it to another. The speed of response depended on whether someone was waiting by the telex machine. Now, transferring funds only require banks to send a swift message containing payment instructions to another bank for funds to be moved at any time in the day. Some banks are selectively opening up their systems to customers, employees, and others. Silicon Valley Bank plans to offer an API for payments by the end of this year. This will allow their tech-savvy customers' systems to process payments without human intervention. BNY Mellon has built an internal online API catalog for services such as pricing, calendars, market, and reference data. This has helped its developers to significantly reduce the number of steps to build new innovative apps. Another potential benefit from APIs will be a reduction in the cost of regulatory data submission. Currently, data submission to MAS is partly manual. We will improve this process. Our vision is for data to flow seamlessly in both directions, between systems in the financial institutions and the MAS. This will reduce the ongoing cost of regulatory submissions. This is not a trivial exercise given the volume and diversity of financial data. Well-crafted APIs are essential for this vision to work. MAS will closely engage the industry to ensure that these APIs are clear, simple to implement, and extensible. I spoke earlier about the telegraph. Despite the breakthrough in world travel and communication enabled by the telegraph and other technologies, the globalization of the late 19th century soon faltered and reversed. There is a lesson here. Technology alone does not make connections or create better understanding. It merely gives us the means to make those connections. What is more important is the spirit of openness and collaboration. Common standards and seamless data sharing are in this spirit. They will enable us to maximize the benefits of digital and mobile technologies, reap enormous cost efficiencies, and extend our reach and understanding. And it is this spirit of openness and collaboration and innovation that will help create a smart financial center. And we have only just begun. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much, Mr. Menon, for this uh, for this closing speech and an, uh, closing speech and enlightening us. Thank you also for for heading an institution that, with other institutions, has helped make Singapore into one of the best-run places in the world, as we've seen. And I think it's that been that that has made possible this Cybos and made this Cybos uh, among uh, among uh, the best the best ever that we've uh, that we've run. Um, I now have the easiest of jobs, which is to close uh, Cybos. Uh, but before I do that, there are a few formalities. One is I need to remind everybody that you are invited to the closing party tonight at the aquarium. The buses leave the hotels at uh, 7 p.m., so I hope to see you all there. I would also like uh, to follow Stefan and, uh, and do a quick tour ahead to next year in Geneva. Um, and I think we have a picture of uh, Geneva uh, somewhere, um, if that made it. This is, this is not Geneva. I, I know that. I know that. Thank you, Singapore. Let's do that first. Let's thank Singapore. Thank, thank you very much for, uh, for making this possible. Now let's look ahead and 
Stefan, uh, as Stefan already said, that we had a delegation of the Geneva Convention Center here look at Cybos. There's a little more to the story than Stefan uh, was telling. Um, one is you should know that the mission statement of Singapore contains something like uh, they want to be the Switzerland of Asia. We had the delegation here of, uh, of Geneva and their first reaction when they saw the event was, oh shoot, this is what you're talking about. Um, and they're now going very hard at work because clearly they don't want, want, they do, the, the master does not want to fall behind with the student. Um, so they're really hard at work at making uh, the, uh, the Geneva Cybos as good or even better. And you can see that in this picture there are a few building cranes there already. So the Swiss are hard at work to make sure that they can keep up with the progress that their student is, uh, is making. So thank you. I hope to see you all there. And with that, I'd like to repeat the tradition of last year and take off my tie to formally declare this Cybos closed. Thank you very much. See you tonight at the party and next year in Geneva. Thank you.